I'm very excited to have Dr. Nicholas Berbulis, uh, Craig Cunningham, one of our organizers, is going to do the formal introduction. I'll just talk about a few business things. I want to acknowledge Sarah Snyder from Interdisciplinary Curriculum Studies and Richard Russo from my Department of Educational Foundations and Inquiry. And it's a pleasure to have you all here. The theme is Technology for Democracy. Um, it really emerged, uh, in my mind, uh, from a lot of conversations. And I think of curriculum as a dialogue, being in and around our own technology and education department, and also from years ago in my personal history, having uh, studied under Professor Elizabeth Ellsworth at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, what was always impressed upon me, and, and I think a lot of our conversations that are emerging in NLU is technology for what? and technology for whom. And so I went back to revisit uh, a reading that was introduced in Dr. Elizabeth Ellsworth's class. Um, and it's in the book, Watch It. And I'll pass the book around. This is Berbulus and McAllister. And uh, it was my first introduction to the idea that technology, of course, is not the utopia or the final answer but it's also not just a tool. And I found um, Professor Berbulis' ideas very um, sensitive and reflective on what at the time when I was in school was both seductive, exciting, powerful, um, and uh, fraught with all kinds of peril. My history was uh, just a little bit more was to look at this reading and look at others. <clears throat> and I was a video enthusiast and still am uh, back in the days of analog. So I became a bit of a specialist. And then along came the information superhighway and I was a novice again, not knowing how to do digital editing and all my skills wasted. <laughs> not wasted. <laughs> not wasted. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, but the, the love of technology is, of course, uh, one of the uh, appealing uh, pieces because we love our tools and uh, uh, we are en enamored with our cell phones and our iPods and our music. And, and the question, again, is to what ends and how does it impact learning in the K through 12 as well as learning outside of the school. In addition to being an influential editor, Nick is a world-renowned philosopher and commentator on contemporary issues in education especially concerning the role of technology in education. If you search YouTube, you can find interviews with him conducted in Argentina this past fall. And just last week, he appeared on Frontline, the PBS documentary program, giving his thoughts on the phenomenon of for-profit colleges and universities. In addition to holding a named professorship, Nick is also director of a brand new unit at UIUC, the Ubiquitous Learning Institute, which, according to its webpage, is, quote, a center for research and inquiry into the changing conditions and possibilities of learning, as well as a site for pedagogical redesign and innovation. As director, Nick has a unique opportunity to participate in what is likely to be the most profound revolution in education since the printing press. Nick's ideas about the role of technology in education do not come out of technology. Unlike me, for example, Nick is no computer nerd. Rather, he has developed a deep understanding of education as a social institution and the ways that schools are affected by social, political, and ideological change. Nick's early work as a scholar focused on the workings of communicative relations and democracies, but he was drawn to issues of technology both through observing the ways that the editorial processes of educational theory were changing and also by his own intuition that technological changes would inevitably affect education and schools. Nick has an uncanny ability to notice educational trends and to predict the future. In 1996, for example, in an article entitled Knowledge at the Crossroads, Some Alternative Futures of Hypertext Learning Environments, written with Thomas A. Callister, Jr., Nick wrote, quote, the educational implications of this issue, that is, the difficulty of finding your way through hypertext as opposed to a linear reading, the educational implications of this issue are profound. Hypertext can permit students to focus their investigations on questions informed, informed by their own particular interests and experiences. They proceed through and organize materials in ways that make sense to them, developing their own heuristics. This flexibility has many advantages, not the least of which is a capacity to accommodate different personal or cultural learning styles. Now, if someone wrote this paragraph in 2010, it would seem pretty routine, but this was 14 years ago. 
when most of the world was just learning what it means to click on a blue underlined word on a web page. <laughs> There's one final part about Nick that must be mentioned here, although it's not part of Nick's official academic biography. Every morning before most of us has wiped the sleep from our eyes, Nick goes online and scours the blogosphere for significant issues and trends related to progressive politics and collects the most important snippets into a blog called Progressive Blog Digest. He's been doing this since 2004, and even before that, he sent it out as a daily email newsletter called Today's News. For some of us, including me, this has become the primary source of political news. By spending 10 minutes reading this blog, I feel I have at least a rudimentary sense of what's important in the political world, and if I'm still curious about any part of it, I can follow the included links to learn more, just like the student that he talked about earlier. You can find Nick's blog at, write this down, <laughs> PBD, that's for Progressive Blog Digest, pbd.blogspot.com. If you forget the URL, just look at Nick's license plate. Oh, that's true. <laughs> you noticed that? Yes. His Subaru says PBD blog. <laughs> Nick's work on the Progressive Blog Digest represents a, come on in, Maya a direct service to democracy in America. I know he does this work uh, because he's fundamentally securing, fundamentally committed to securing, as John Dewey wrote in 1939, quote, plural, partial, and experimental methods in securing and maintaining an ever-increasing release of the powers of human nature in service of a freedom which is cooperative and a cooperation which is voluntary. Those are quote from Dewey. And like Dewey, Nick's commitment to democracy isn't just theoretical. He's working on the front lines on its behalf. Please join me in warmly welcoming Nick Rodriguez to today's I'm going to start by doing the philosopher's thing, which is we have these words in this title, Technology for Democracy. Uh, let's think about those words just a little bit. Um, as some of you know, I know Craig knows, uh, John Dewey has some very interesting things to say about democracy. And one of the most interesting things he says about democracy is that the way that we think about it is mostly wrong. If you ask most people, what is a democracy, they'll say something like, uh, a system where you get to vote for your leaders. Dewey says, that's not the most important thing about democracy. That's not what makes a democracy a democracy. And that particular element is worthless without, in fact, probably counterproductive, without other really important social and cultural norms, are, are, which are what actually makes a democracy democratic. What are some of those norms um, and values? One is having access to information. But the other is working to become informed about the information that's there. Again, one is not any good without the other. Um, if you're thinking along with me, you're already thinking about the internet, for example. Uh, encountering and engaging other points of view, particularly points of view that disagree with you, that you know will disagree with you. Um, a broad attitude of civic respect and connections with other people, people like you and people not like you. Dewey argues very strongly that a democracy is not worth having if it doesn't have those characteristics and values. And that specifically, the right of voting is, as I said before, worthless or counterproductive if the people who take advantage of that privilege don't have these other characteristics. Increasingly, the ways in which these things are happening today are happening with and through technology. And I'll talk about more of that, more of that in a second. Let's talk about technology a little bit. Uh, another notion that I think is often misunderstood, and, and Todd touched on some of my own thinking about this already. We often tend to think of technologies as things, um, a computer, a fork, a pair of scissors, a light switch, an automobile. And when we talk about technology, we usually talk about the things that constitute particularly new technologies um, and un sometimes unfamiliar. I want to suggest, uh, this is not an original point, it also comes partly from Dewey, a relational view of technology. That a technology is never the thing in itself. It's the thing in itself in relation to us. And that relational quality has a lot of implications. One is, there isn't just one way in which a technology can be used. A shoe can be a hammer. A hammer can be a paperweight. A paperweight can be a murder weapon. Um, we sometimes talk as if a technology or a tool 
dictates the ways in which it's going to be used. And yet, if we think about these things at all, we know that technologies are often used in ways that are quite different from the ways in which they were intended to be used. 